So this is a CFR engine. Uh, this is the actual engine right back here. Um, everything else is you know, associated with the engine, of course. Of course, this is the engine down here as well. Um, these are the fuel tanks. This is the instrumentation console. So what I'd like to do is just describe the basics of the CFR engine. I'm not really going to talk much about how to operate it. Um, first, I would note that CFR stands for Cooperative Fuel Research. Um, this engine is originally designed in order to test octane numbers for fuels. Um, we have three different fuel tanks. Um, each fuel tank um, has a knob directly below it. And as we rotate that knob, we actually raise or lower the fuel tank, which then will actually raise or lower the fuel to air ratio. So as we do that, um, you know, you'll actually see the fuel meniscus in here, although right now the tank is not full of fuel. Um, we'll put that in shortly. Um, so you'll actually be able to see uh, at least a relative measure of the fuel to air ratio. So that's one of the adjustments. Um, this engine also has the ability to adjust the timing. So um, we'll, we'll actually show this once we operate it, but if we just loosen this nut here, uh, as we new, move this knob back and forth, that will change the timing of the engine. So, you know, in other words, we'll be able to advance or retard the spark. Um, we do have a timing light here. Um, now it's not operating now because the engine is not yet on, but you know, we're gonna point that right here at the scale. Um, this scale is actually connected to the crankshaft. Um, so that's going to give you your measure of the spark timing. So that's one of the things that's adjustable. And what's probably the most unique about this particular engine is that it has an adjustable cylinder head. This is a one cylinder four stroke engine, by the way. So this whole cylinder head actually has the ability to rise and fall. Um, what we would do is we'd simply unlock it. Uh, be real careful. Uh, the design is such that if you unlock it incorrectly, you can actually bang up into this micrometer, and this is actually going to give us our measure of the cylinder head position. So we can unlock it, and then you can see that as we rotate, um, the micrometer is changing, so that means we're either increasing or decreasing the position of the cylinder head. So this is also adjustable. Um, generally, we're going to run this engine at 600 RPM. Um, this is a governed engine. Um, there's a large electric motor here and that's actually used as a governor. So it's designed to spin the engine and keep it at exactly 600 RPM. So we're going to run it at 600 RPM and at the same time we're going to adjust the cylinder head position to a 6 to 1 compression ratio and that 6 to 1 compression ratio corresponds to a micrometer setting of exactly 0 0.600. So if we kind of get in close here um, you'll notice that there's actually an inner scale. That inner scale is the tenths, so you want the inner scale pointing at exactly 0.6, and then the outer scale at zero. So, you know, right there is actually 0 0.600. That's our 6 to 1 compression ratio. Now, you'll note that when you lock it in place, uh, it decreases the setting ever so slightly. So, I put it about 2 or 3 below the zero, and then when you lock it, it locks pretty much right at zero. There we go. So right now, 0.6 on the inside, zero on the outside, so that's actually 0 0.600. The outside scale is the hundreds and thousands, okay? So when it's reading 10 or 90, um, that's really 0 0.010 or 0 0 0.090 added to whatever it says on the small inside scale, okay? So <coughs> this is the engine. Um, if we look at some of the instrumentation and controls <coughs> over on this side, um, we have the ability to adjust the air temperature. So this little air heater rheostat is going to adjust the temperature. Um, right here it gives you the amps going through the air heater. It's just an electric heater. Um, it comes through this wire and the electric heater is right here on the air intake. So that allows us to heat up the air. And the thermometer right here in the front is going to give us our ability to record the air temperature. So, you know, here's where we do our air temperature. Um, we also have the ability to heat up the oil. So this is our lube oil heater. Um, typically we run this at about medium just to keep the temperature in the prescribed range. Um, typically it's between about 120 and 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So when this is on, um, hopefully this will read properly. Um, there's a loose wire in here now. I mean, geez, this thing is 60 years old. It was manufactured in about 1957 or 56. Um, so it's a rather old device. But nonetheless, most things are working great. 
Um, sometimes this isn't working properly. Um, sometimes if we just kind of click on some of the wires here, whatever's loose is uh, you know, gonna re-engage and it reads the proper lube oil temperature. But nonetheless, we had turned on the lube oil using this here. Um, we can also heat up the fuel air mixture, which we typically do not do, but you know, we do have the ability to do that. Um, and then also noting this particular device, this is the knock meter. That's what's really the most unique about this particular um, engine. Um, this is giving you a measure of the knock intensity, and that's what we need to utilize when we're actually um, determining the octane number for a particular fuel. Okay? Now, the knock meter itself um, is actually not connected right now. Um, I have everything set up for the PV diagram experiment, um, but this is the knock meter. It's really just a pressure transducer of sorts. And we're going to put this into the one and only instrumentation port, which is right here. Um, but again, since this is set up for the PV diagram experiment, um, I'm trying to measure pressure rather than knock intensity. So we have a high-speed pressure transducer in here. Um, this one is air-cooled, so we have a little air line hooked up. And over here um, is just the electric connection that hooks up to our computer. Um, nonetheless, this will be installed when we do the octane number experiment. Um, but that'll be the, the second one, well, the second one that I'm going to record today, probably the first one you guys are going to look at um, as you look at these videos. Um, and then we should also note that we do need to make sure that the cooling water system is on properly for this engine. So when we actually operate it, um, we might note that back here is the building's water supply. So we just need to make sure that the water supply is on. Um, we're going to pull this green valve handle towards us. Um, we don't need the full building water pressure. Um, typically, you just pull it, you know, maybe just a, not even an eighth of a turn. And there's a little red dot that you can't see from the video. But if you look straight down into the valve, there's a little red dot. Um, and there's a hole on the valve handle. So when the hole goes over the red dot, you know that you're at the right position. And then when we're running the system with a pressure transducer in it, we need to make sure that the building air supply is on. So um, right back here is a regulated air pressure. Um, here's a pressure regulator. It's regulated at 20 pounds. Uh, we just turn this on, and that gives us the right pressure of air. Um, that's actually going to cool the pressure transducer. Um, and then one last thing that we would note is that since we're inside the building, um, this particular engine exhaust is hooked up to its own exhaust system that goes out to the roof. And then over here on the wall of the lab behind us is just the switch that turns this from off to on. So it's pretty obvious when this thing is working. Okay. Now, let me go ahead and start up this engine um, just to give you a brief experience as to how it starts. Um, the first thing we need to do is we need to make sure that there's fuel in the appropriate tanks. Um, I think right now I'm just going to use tank number two. Okay. So I've got the gasoline. I'm just going to pour it into tank two here. Um, you can see that there's a sight glass on the front of the tank. And as I add fuel, we are filling up number two. So. For now, I'm just going to fill it up about halfway. So now we've got fuel in tank number two. Now I am going to use tank number two. So there's a little knob right here. And again, if we get in close, you'll see there's little numbers. Um, this is a number one, which means it's actually drawing fuel out of tank number one. So I'm going to rotate it over. Uh, well, I rotated the wrong way. There's tank number three, and I want to put it on tank number two. So we just make sure it's pointing at tank number two. So we're actually ready to start up this engine now. Um, the exhaust is on. Um, the air is flowing to the transducer. And now we're just going to start it. So uh, to start the engine, you just move this knob from stop to start. And that's only going to engage the governor. So that's just going to get the engine spinning. And then we're going to turn on the ignition. 
<coughs> you'll definitely notice the uh, different sound. You'll, you'll, you'll hear the engine starting to engage. And then once that's on, um, then we can go ahead and run whatever experiment we have. Um, for now, I'm just gonna show you how everything gets turned on. And then when we talk about the individual experiments, we'll set things up appropriately. So it's gonna be a little bit loud. I'm not gonna talk much, but here we go. So there we go. Um, what I'm also gonna do is after I turn the ignition on, I'm gonna adjust the timing just so you can see how the timing gets adjusted. So ignition, and you definitely hear a slight change. And now let's just set the timing. So here's my timing light. Um, the magnetic pickup on the timing light is connected on the distributor wire from the coil, which is right here, to the spark plug, which is back in there. So every time current flows through there, the magnetic pickup senses that and flashes the light. So I want to make sure that we have it set properly. Um, typically, we'd set it at about 13 or 15 degrees. So that's what we'll aim for. So I'm just going to push on the light. Um, you can see right now it's actually set at about 20. So what I do is I adjust this knob here. I just loosen it and then just kind of spin it down a little bit. I'm actually moving this whole arm here counterclockwise. And I'm going to get down to 13. And I'm just going to lock it in place. All right, so that's how we're going to adjust the timing. And then if we needed to adjust the fuel to air ratio, which we will do, <coughs> what we need to do here is look at the appropriate sight glass. Not the sight glass that measures the level of the fuel, but the glass down here that measures our fuel to air ratio. So this is actually behind. Um, let me grab a small flashlight. Yep, I have my small flashlight. And what we want to do is look at this gauge back there. So it's going to be a kind of tight viewing angle, but I'll do it in red. Um, so you can see that tank back in here. It's, it's the one behind. Um, can you see it from there? Okay, so you can see that right now um, the level is pointing to about 1.5. So what I do is I'm going to adjust the height of the tank. Oops, by the way, I'm going to actually raise the tank, and that's going to adjust the fuel to ratio. You can see that that meniscus level is rising, and typically this would be at about 1.2. This is pretty much what it is now for our particular experiment. And you can do the same thing with any of the fuel tanks. Now, the only reason I'm not using tank three or tank one right now is that they both have slight leaks in them. Um, that's okay for demonstration purposes. Of course, if we're running the lab in person, then our lab technician would change out the O-rings and make sure that there's no more leakage. Um, but for now, at least we can see how to adjust that. So we see how to adjust the fuel to air ratio with this knob. Um, we see how to adjust the timing with this knob. And that's the basic operations of this particular engine. So right now, I'm just going to turn it off um, it's really simple. All we do is turn the ignition to off and then stop the engine entirely. So that's just a demonstration of how to utilize this particular engine.